Thank you, Brother Jake. Amen. Good morning. So let's get the main question out of the way. How many is done with your Christmas shopping? Well, the rest of y'all are in trouble. Well, thank God you're not done because you can put me on the list. So, no, good to see you. God bless you for being here. We're so excited to get to share the Word of God with you again. We also welcome our Life Church family in Livingston. Livingston, it's good to be with you. Thank you for all you do in your community. Also, Sparta Life Church, it's good to be with you, and God bless you for what you are doing in your community. Wherever you're at in the world, we, we are, we're excited that we get to share the Word of God with you. Welcome to our service, and then we give a special welcome to all of our family in the correctional facilities. Can we welcome them to church? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, let me just uh, uh, go along with what Pastor Jake was saying about our neighbors who are suffering this morning and I know many of you have uh, already prayed for them. Those have gone through this tragedy of tornadoes. They're still trying to locate and rescue uh, people. And so uh, keep them in your prayers uh, just um, for their families and for those who are working trying to uh, rescue others. I will let you know, thank you so much uh, for your always generous giving. Uh, because of that, you know we... Um, uh, over this past year have brought, bought several vehicles, which we call our duo ministry, doing unto others. And uh, we've got the last vehicle in the shop now getting uh, retrofitted. It'll be our dental bus, and it is fantastic, and we're excited about it. But this is why we do it. So this, just last night, I got a message that the Middle Tennessee Disaster Relief has dispatched duo to assist in Dredston, Tennessee. And so we'll be taking food trailer and generators this Tuesday to go up and assist in the cleanup. And so thank you, Life Church, that we have resources available that when our state, when our neighbors need us, we're able to go and, and be what, what Christ needs us to be. So thank you so much for being willing to do that. Um, we'll also be giving a donation. Many of you remember this uh, uh, ministry. It's, it's a worldwide ministry. They came and they, when our tornadoes hit, uh, the tornado hit down in the Baxter area, uh, Christ in Action showed up and they uh, parked all their vehicles here and we were able to feed them and love on them and give them monies as they helped in our community. Well, they're about to, to launch into this uh, disaster and this tragedy and so we'll be giving them a donation on behalf of Jesus and because of your generosity. So I just want to say again, thank you so much. This season is all about what? Giving. For God so loved the world, he gave. Amen. So thank you so very much. Um, well, this morning, uh, I want to talk to you. Uh, I've entitled this message, Jesus, God's Gift That Keeps On Giving. God's Gift That Keeps On Giving. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Listen to what the Holy Spirit through Paul says. Now, thanks be to God for his gift. Notice what his, and we know his gift is Jesus, but listen how the Word of God tries to uh, describe this gift to us. Thanks be to God for his gift, precious beyond telling. Our words can't even put in, uh, we can't even put into words the gift that God gave us. And if we're not careful, I told the crowd last night, you know, sometimes we just need to sit down and really contemplate on what it is God did through Jesus Christ, that he came and died the death that you and I should have died. He came, he didn't have to. You know, God, he created us. He could have looked down and said, well, y'all screwed up. Now your fate is doomed, but he didn't. He loved us so much that God himself came in a very humble way and died a very horrible death for you and I. That's why this gift is precious beyond telling. It says his indescribable, inexpressible, free gift. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Listen to this gift. This is prophesied 700 years before Christ was born in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. For a child is born, everybody say to us. Jesus made it all about us, guys. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. And in this prophecy, it's a description of who Jesus Christ is and will be. And I want you to know that Jesus, yes, he came to die a horrible death, to be resurrected so he could purchase our salvation. So you and I, when we exit this planet, we can go live with God forever in heaven. Yes, that is true. But I want you to know Jesus came. The gift of Jesus is so much more than that. Thank God for that. But he's the gift that keeps on giving. And these four areas I want, to discuss, uh, I want us to discuss real quickly is the things he wants to give to us. First of all, it says he's wonderful counselor. It says he's a mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. So let's discuss these. First of all, wonderful counselor. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. Now listen, I believe in counseling. I do. Some people don't believe in counseling. I do. Let me tell you why I believe in counseling, because I've had a lot of it. <laughs> there is people that have went to school for years to mess with this old boy. But I believe in counseling. I believe God has called and ordained godly counselors. You know the ones I know that really need counseling is the ones that say to me, I don't believe in that stuff. That's the ones that need it. Because they're already full of their own pride. Listen, if we don't believe in counseling, godly counseling, then we don't believe in Jesus Christ because it calls him a wonderful counselor. So I believe in counseling. And we have many counselors that go to this church. But here's what I want you to know. A human counselor can help uncover and discover the issues or the pains in your life. They can help reveal but Jesus Christ is the only counselor that can truly heal. That's why he's the wonderful counselor. Notice in John chapter 5, verse number 1. It says this, After there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity for 30 and 8 years. How many know that's a long time to have the same sickness? 38 years. This man was lame. He could not walk. People had to carry him there. And he sat there all day waiting to, to, for somebody to put him in the pool. I'm sure begging. 38 years. Now notice this. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there, been now a long time in that case, in that case he, said, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now stop a minute. You know this man had, had to heard, heard about Jesus. Jesus had become very famous. Why? Because he's opening blind eyes. He's opening deaf ears. He's feeding entire cities with one little lunch. He's raising the dead. He's casting out demons. So that guy, Jesus, walks up to this man who's been sick 38 years and said, hey, do you want to be well? Do you want to be whole? Now, if you think about that, what would have your, your response have been? If you knew that this miracle worker is talking to you, and he said, hey, do you want to be made whole? I don't know about you, but I'd have said, uh, absolutely. I'd have thrown both hands in the air like I just don't care, wouldn't you? Hey, I want to be whole. I want you to notice this man's response. Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, sir. Now notice these words. I have no man. I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I'm coming, another step it down before me. Notice where his dependency was. Notice where his, if you will, faith was. It was in another human being. Now listen, there are times when others can help us. But here he's got the miracle worker. He's got the wonderful counselor standing in front of him saying, wilt thou be made whole? And the first thing he says is, I don't have a man. See, sometimes others can help us, and we need their help, but there are times when they can't. Why? Because their resources are limited. But I want you to know that we have a wonderful counselor, 
who has no limitations. Listen to Isaiah 9, verse 6 in the message translation. For a child has been born for us. The gift of a son for us. He'll take over running the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. His ruling authority will grow, notice this now, and there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings. See, Jesus is a counselor, ladies and gentlemen, that can bring wholeness when no one else can. And often we run to everybody else but him. 30 years ago, and this is a story you've heard a lot. It's my story. It's the only one I have to come up with another, and I'd have to lie to you. But as I was just studying for this this week and just thinking about Jesus being a wonderful counselor, I thought about my own life 30 years ago. I can't describe to you the darkness I was living in. I've tried to now for almost 18 years, but I can't describe it. I, I, it was so dark. I, again, I remember, I can remember one of the last things that I remember in, in my stronghold, in my addiction, is sitting in my home by myself, hadn't seen anyone in days, sitting in the dark, hadn't slept, Hadn't, hadn't eat anything, and I'd been sitting there for days just infecting myself with drugs and alcohol. I'm sure almost dead because your heart can't take as much drugs as I was doing. But I'm in, the, in that house by myself. All the lights turned out. Got one window painted black so nobody could see in. Couch pushed in front of the deadbolt door. And I'm sitting between my washer and dryer with a shotgun in my hand, freaked out of my head, thinking just like this third man of 38 years, my life is never going to be livable again. I had literally, guys, and you, if you've never been here, you, I can't describe it. I had lost all hope. I had none left. I will always be this way. I'm going to die this way. And I felt pretty soon. So I'm sitting there, I'm wanting to die, but I'm afraid to. And so I can kind of get where this man was at. I don't have anybody. Nobody can help me. But it was shortly after that, when I went into that program, they took us to a church on a Sunday morning, much like the service you're sitting in. Still had some of that hopelessness, just that I wasn't sitting in the, in the dark in the washer and dryer sitting in a church, but I still had that hopelessness and all of a sudden, I heard the wonderful counselor say, "Will thou be made whole? And I want you to know, I've been whole now for 30 years. Amen. Listen, listen. Have I been perfect? Absolutely not. Have I messed up? Absolutely. But I want you to know, Jesus Christ did something for me that no man, woman, or anybody else can do. And I'm telling you today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what situation you're in. But the Savior, the wonderful counselor, is saying to some of you, wilt thou be made whole? Do you want your life back? Do you want a life? That's why we call this life church. Why? Because he can give us life. He is the wonderful counselor. So number one, Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Number two, Jesus is our mighty God. John 1, verse 1. This is the Christmas story according to John. He don't start with a manger and a baby. He starts at the very beginning. In the beginning, the Word, talking about Jesus, already existed. The Word was with God and the Word, everybody say, was God. And the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. See, here's the question the world is asking today. See, the world can't get rid of, who, of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's in the history books. It is a historical fact that a man named Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago. They can't get rid of that. But the debate that they continually have is, is this Jesus, is he a good man or is he really the God man? That's the question. Is he a good man or is he a God man? 
Well, let me just say this. If he is not the God man, then he cannot be a good man. Why? Because he himself said, I'm God. He declared it many, many times. We won't take time to go through the scriptures, but he himself declared, I am God. That's why the religious crowd hated him because they couldn't believe anybody would have the audacity to make that statement. But see, if Jesus is not God, then that makes him a lying lunatic and nobody should follow him. But if he is, you better give him your life and your heart and your worship. And I want you to know that he is. See, there's people that'll say, well, I believe Jesus was a good man. I just don't believe he was God. I had that statement made to me um, several years ago when our church was at the former location, a little bitty spot of ground over on Woodland Avenue, not very far from here. What had happened was, uh, there was a lady started bringing her kids to our church. And man, Jesus really began to work in her and the kids' lives. She was married to a man that didn't go to our church, and he was actually of the, the Islamic faith. And what began to happen, at first he really didn't care, but the, the more she got involved in the church and the more Jesus began to transform her life, the angrier he became. He became angrier and angrier, violent. We had even had to call the police on him one night over at the church on a Wednesday night. Wasn't long after that, I got a phone call. It was from her, and she's weeping uncontrollably. Me and one of my deacons went over there, and he had violently attacked her in the house. Just got real ugly. Well, long story short, they had separated. And one day, Al Profont, he was my secretary. It was just me and Al. Al was in his mid-60s. I told him, I said, you're the sexiest secretary I've ever seen. <laughs> Al called, buzzed my office, and he said, hey, um, and he called this gentleman's name. Uh, he said, he is uh, coming over. And he said, he says he comes in peace, but pastor, I'm not... And I said, here's what we're going to do, Al. I said, I'm going to go down to the basement of the church. When he comes in, you send him down there. Because I just wanted it to be me and him. I didn't want Al or anybody else around if the dude did decide to do something. I said, I just want it to be me and him. And so I'm downstairs waiting on him. He comes in. And he, you could tell he's upset. And so we sat down across the table from each other. He looked at me and he said, I want you to know you have ruined my family. You have divided my family. I said, no, sir. I haven't divided your family. I said, the problem is your wife has fell in love with Jesus because she knows Jesus loves her. And I said, what you need to understand is when Jesus came, he made a statement. He said, people think that I came to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. And I will set mother against daughter and father against son and husband against wife. What was he saying? There's going to be times when people choose to give their life to me, and it's going to make others hate them for it. And I said, you hate your wife because you hate Jesus. That's why. And he said, well, I want you to know, I think Jesus, the Koran teaches us, and I think Jesus was a good man. I think he was a prophet. I'm just not ever going to say he's God. And I told him the same thing I just told you. I said, listen. Jesus Christ himself said he was God. So that if he said that and he's not, that makes him not a good man, makes him a liar and a lunatic. I said, I want you to know Jesus Christ is God. And he said, no, what? there's nobody come to the Father except through him. He said, are you telling me that if I don't accept Jesus Christ, I'm not going to heaven? I said, Better than, I said more than that, I'm telling you, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you're going straight to hell. I said, because I'm telling you right now, Muhammad is already there. And I said, if you think you came over here and intimidate me, you're wrong. Because you kill me, I win. <laughs> but I told him, I said, but I want you to know, I love you and Jesus loves you. And he wants to change your life. And he wants to bring you salvation. But here's what I want. Here's why I tell you that story. There are people out there who are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. They think, oh, yeah, Jesus was a good man. I just don't know. No, he's either God or he's not. And I'm telling you, he's God. And I know that gets a lot more pushback today than it used to. 
As I told you in the culture vultures, there's some things that they're telling us we can't say. And one of them, one of the things that they say we can't say is that Jesus is the only way because that's, that's uh, not inclusive or that's not uh, uh, politically correct. Well, here's what I want you to know. Jesus Christ did not say I'm a way. He said I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to come to the Father except through that. I will never quit saying that. You see, you know the other reason I know that Jesus Christ is not just a good man, but he's a God man? All over this world, billions of people worship him. Think about that. All over this world. So if, listen, if the word doesn't convince you, let the world convince you. If the word does not convince you Jesus is God, look at the world. What do I mean? Do you understand that the world calendar was set by the birth of this baby? I was just in Turkey. Guess what year it is in Turkey? 2021. And so it is in Germany. It's even that way in Bangham. It's 2021. <laughs> Nobody else has split history in two. And if you don't think that's remarkable, he only lived 33 years. Some of you hadn't done nothing in 70 years. I'm just kidding. But think about that a minute. He only lived 33 years. And he, he never held office. He wasn't from a royal family, although we know he was. But on earth, he wasn't from a royal family. He never held office. He never acted in a movie. He never wrote a book that we know of. Listen, Jesus lived, when you consider the earth, he lived on a, in a village the size of a postage stamp. And he never traveled farther than 200 miles, yet he's had a global impact. Only God could do that. Amen. Only God could do that. And the last thing I'll tell you that convinces me is why is his name so hated? It's so loved and adored that billions worship him, but it's the most hated name when it comes to faith in our world. Pe people don't care if you say Buddha, 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 Buddha. Rub his belly. <laughs> You're making fun of him. Yes, I am. People don't care if you say Muhammad, but if you start saying Jesus, they'll kick you off the football field. They'll kick you out of the stadiums. They'll kick you out of the Congress. Why? Because Satan hates that name because he knows there's power in that name. That's why. Jesus is not just a good man. Jesus is the God man. He is our mighty God. So he's a wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God. And number three, Jesus is our everlasting father. Now, here's the, one, here's the kicker about that. I thought he's the son. But you, you, saw, you read it with me. It says he's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Why would it say that? Because besides coming to purchase our salvation, the other main reason Jesus Christ came was to reveal the father. He said it all the time. In John 10, verse 30, he said this, the father and I are one. We're the same. And, uh, John 14, 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Do you don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but the Father who lives in me does this work, his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. He said, hey, you want to know why I came? When you look at me, you see the Father. Colossians 1.15 says this to us. Christ, who is he? He is, the, he is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Listen, if you want to see the Father, just look at the Son. Read the scriptures. Look at who Jesus is he is God's expression. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these last final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as inheritance, and through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. What is the character of God? Read about the characteristics of Jesus. He is the expression of God. 
And he sustains, sustains all things, everything by his mighty power of command. When he had cleansed us from our sin, he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Jesus is the expression of the Father. So, what did he express? What was it he expressed? Go read his biography, Love and Grace. Everywhere he went, he was healing people. Everywhere he went, he was leaning into sinners, people who had messed up many, many, many times. That's why the religious crowd could not stand him because they wanted to distance themselves from those people. Jesus ran toward those people. Jesus is love and grace, and he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. See, Jesus understood something, and we still have that problem today. Many have a misinterpretation of God. They have a misinterpretation of God. They see God as some old, cranky, grumpy, mean old man with a belt in his hand saying, bend over. That's how they see God. That's how I used to see God. He's just ticked off. He's just mad. He's quick to get angry. But you know, the Old Testament even shows us that's not who the Father is. Let me show you. Exodus chapter 34, verse 5. This is when Moses, who wrote the Ten Commandments, uh, he said, God, show me who you are. I want to know your characteristics. I want to know your nature. And God said, okay. And notice what he says. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am quick to get ticked. Is that what he said? Is that what he said? No. He said, I am slow to anger. You better be thankful. I hate to wipe me and you out a long time ago. He said, I'm slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. That's what Jesus came to reveal. He came to reveal God's nature, and God's nature is to nurture. Matthew 7, 11, notice this. So if you sinful, this is Jesus talking, so if you sinful people, carnal, human Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? Not just more. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Some of you will blow all kinds of money here in the next, you probably already have, for your kids. Because you love your kids. You love to give to your kids. And the Bible says, do you actually think that you're a better parent than me? And the, the right answer we would always give was, well, no, but so many times we act like we are when we have a wrong view of God. We act like we're better parents. See, we, we think about God when we struggle, he no longer wants to snuggle. He wants to push us away. You did it again. Stay away from me. That is not God. He said, I'm full of mercy I'm full of love. I'm full of kindness. I'm slow to get angry. Thinking about my own parenting and just being a dad, Christopher and Emily, they both have some great strengths. It's amazing when you look at your kids, even though they're different, that they they come with great strengths built in. I look at Chris and some of his strengths uh, I do not have. I saw a lot of his strengths in Jennifer's dad, a man whom I always very much admired. Wisdom, stability. I look at Emily, and she's got strengths. Wow, I mean, (laughs) I don't care what kind of day you have, she can light it up. They both got great strengths. Now, they got some weaknesses, and Jennifer can tell you about those, and came from her side of the family, but uh, (laughs) I'm just kidding. You just saw my weakness. But you know, I look back at my parenting when my kids was growing up. I saw their strengths. Emily uh, played volleyball. Chris played baseball and football. I saw their strengths, and I admired their strengths. But you know, their strengths is is not what drew me the closest to them. It was their struggles. That's what drew me closest You parents know what I'm talking about. You grandparents. That baby's got 103 fever. You won't leave that room. You'll lay in that bed with them even if you know you might get that fever. 
Why? Because it's their, do you understand that's who got it? When you struggle, he wants to snuggle. See, some of you, it says he's an everlasting father. Some of you, your father abandoned you. Sad, but it's true. He abandoned you. See, God wants you to know, because sometimes we view our heavenly father the way we view our earthly father. And God wants you to know, hey, 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 your father may have some weaknesses, but I'm strong. I'm an everlasting father. Matter, matter of fact, Hebrews 13, 5, he told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he didn't say, unless, there's, there's no unless. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Number one, Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Number two, Jesus is our mighty God. Number three, he is our everlasting father. Number four, Jesus is our prince of peace. Something very needed right now in our world, this peace, this peace that passes understanding. Do you understand the reason he's called a prince of peace is because the Bible says he can give you a peace that passes your understanding. It means it blows your carnal mind. It's those times you think I should be falling apart, biting all my nails off, banging my head against the wall, but something on the inside just calmed me down. I'm just, I'm good. That's priceless. I said, that's priceless. See, money can't buy this. Money can buy you a nice bed, but it can't buy you sleep. He is the prince of peace. To have his peace, you need to make him your prince. He's the prince of peace. Jesus gives three types of peace. I'm going to go through them real quickly. Number one, peace with God. Number two, peace with them. Peace within. And number three, peace with them. Peace with God. Peace within. Peace with them. Number one, peace with God. Romans chapter five, verse one. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Now see, before Jesus came, sin had dominated mankind. Sin had separated, the Bible says, us from God. Matter of fact, the Bible says we were enemies of God. Why would, had we become enemies of God? Because sin, God can have no fellowship with sin. So it made us enemies. So Jesus came down with his blood, purchased our salvation, washed away that sin, and said, now you and dad are good again. And that's why we have peace with God. And what I want you to see the scripture says here is we have peace with God because, why? Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. So peace with God does not come from what you and I have done. It came, comes from what he has done. And see, that's so hard for some of us to get a hold of. When I went into that program and I looked back over the last years that I had infected myself with drugs and just lived a horrible, ugly, ungodly life, I struggled with it. But then finally the Holy Spirit showed me it's not about what you've done or haven't done. It's about what I did. And you've got to put your faith in me. So if you want peace with God today, get your focus on what you've done and get your focus on what he did. And that'll bring you peace with God. See, every other religion, every other religion, this is why it's amazing grace. We sing amazing grace, why? Every other religion is man trying to find peace with God, but it's only by Christ dying, not our trying, that we have peace with God. Other religions is all about from the time, the first day you get involved in that religion, climbing your way up to God. But see, Jesus knew man couldn't climb his way up to God, so therefore Jesus climbed his way down to us. That's how we obtain peace with God. But see, the peace with God then gives us access to the peace of God or peace within. See, people will never obtain peace within until they have peace with him because we don't have access to it. I want to show you in Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story, but I see so many people, and, 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 and they're not bad people. It's just a, a lack of understanding. But so many people, even those who get saved, I've had tell me over the years, I just have no peace, Pastor. I just have no peace. And now, you know, have you accepted Jesus Christ? You're born, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just still don't have any peace. And then I've had them to even say this, I can't wait, I don't want to die today, but I can't wait till I get to heaven so I can just enjoy some peace. And my reply is always, don't wait. Don't wait to get to heaven. 
to enjoy some peace. Matter of fact, it'd be easier on the rest of us. <laughs> and if you're going to wait to heaven, just go a little sooner, praise God. But no, listen, don't wait to go to heaven and get peace. Listen to the Christmas story, Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And everybody say, On earth. On earth, on earth what? Peace. Good will toward. Jesus came to bring peace on earth. Not just peace in heaven someday. Jesus, listen, Jesus did not promise us world peace. This is where we get it confused. He did not promise us world peace. He promised us peace in this world. There's a difference. John 14, 27, Jesus said this, peace I leave with you, my peace. Notice that he makes a distinction here. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. I want you to understand my peace and the world peace has nothing to do with one another. My peace I'm giving to you, it's not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know what Jesus is saying? He was saying the world's peace is circumstantial and it hinges on an ever-changing world. He said, but my peace is substantial and it hinges on my never-changing word. He didn't promise us world peace. He promised us peace in this world. See, the world's peace is hard to get and easy to lose. Jesus' peace is easy to get and hard to lose. I'd say if you're not tapped into that one, you need to. See, the thing is, so many of us are waiting on circumstances to change to find some peace. If this world would just calm down, it's never gonna calm down. There's crazy people among us. Are you listening to me? Did you know scientifically they've proven that one in three people are weird? <laughs> they've scientifically proven that. So here's what I want you to do. Look at the person on your left. Look at the person on your right. If they're not weird, then you know who is. <laughs> you bunch of weirdos. Listen. Jesus promises us peace in this world, and it's priceless. So peace with God comes through putting our faith in Jesus Christ, brings peace within, but then this is the last one. Peace within brings peace with them. What do I mean? Having God's peace inwardly creates peace outwardly with other people. Did you know that there's no such thing as irreconcilable differences if you have the true inner peace of Jesus Christ in your life? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say the reason there's so many divisions and the reason there's so many uh, uh, people in opposition to one another is because one or both parties do not have the peace of God on the inside. Peace within creates peace within. When outer peace is gone, something is wrong with our inner peace. And here's the kicker. You know when you study the scriptures in the New Testament, you'll see two words that always go together, always. Here they are, grace and peace. Check me out on that, see if I'm not telling you the truth. Paul, the apostle in his letters would always uh, end his letters with grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Grace and peace. Wherever you find grace, you'll find peace. And wherever you find peace, you'll find grace. They're, they're twins, they just, they, they're conjoined. You can't separate them. Grace and peace. What's that mean to us? When I have an issue, and I'm not always done this right, but when there's somebody that's maybe done me wrong or attacking me, when I can see why a pers that person acts the way they do, I tend to give them more grace. And it's not always easy to do, but I'll give you an example real quick. My daddy Daddy had been in heaven for, oh, a little over 18 years. And this is not to dishonor my dad. This is actually to honor my dad. And I'm going to tell you why. My daddy never really connected with us kids on an emotional level. He was home but absent. Um, I can't remember ever really sitting in daddy's lap. I, he, I was 35 when he died. I don't think he ever told me he loved me. 
Um, I played baseball. He never came to one game. Now, he was married to my mama for 51 years. I thought you was going to honor him. I am. Because, see, I knew my daddy had been abused as a kid, but I didn't know how bad until after he had died and his sister moved in with my mother when she was dying. And my mother took care of her the last months of her life. And she began to tell stories about what my dad went through as a kid. And she said, Geneva, I'm talking to my mom, she said, I can remember when Hal, that was my dad, I can remember when he was five years old and he would have to sleep out in the woods by himself all night. Can you imagine a five-year-old being out in the woods by themselves? Because he's afraid to come in because his daddy would be drunk and would beat him. Bad. Five. As he grew up, the beatings got worse and worse and worse. One time they had to call the sheriff because he's trying to shoot him. When I understand that, first of all, I think it's a miracle he stayed with my mama for 51 years because that would, that would do something to your mind, folks, if that had been your whole life. So now I can give him a little grace. Are you listening to me? Now I can give my daddy grace. He loved me as best as he knew how. See, you can't ask for somebody for something they don't have. If I need a $100 bill and I come to you and say I need $100, but all you got is five, I can't get mad at you because you don't have it. You can only give what you got. My dad gave the best he could. You understand it is true when we say hurt people hurt people. They do because they're hurting. So you know what we need to do? Help people. And when we help people, help people, help people. And why is it so important that grace and peace go together? Because when I extend grace, like such as to my dad, it brings me a peace. That's why they go together. You want to live in peace? Start giving grace. Start giving grace. See, I'm not making excuses for my dad, but I do want to be excused from my own frustration and bitterness in life. My, my cousin, my first cousin, passed away this Tuesday. His mama passed away just two months before that. Pastor Eddie was preaching the funeral right here yesterday. He made this statement. He said, listen, you family members and you friends said you can't say what you need to say to Rick anymore on this side. There can be no com more conversations. If you had aught with him, you can't make it right now because it's too late. So if you got aught with each other, make it right now. Love on each other right now. Can I tell you something, folks? Let me just set you free this Christmas. Life's too short to live it ticked off, angry, and mad. Get over it. Get over it. Well, that's, you may say, that's easy for you to say. Yeah, it is. Watch this. Get over it. See how easy that is? It's just as easy for you to say it. That, if you want to know what kind of counselor Pastor Bob is, right here it is. Get over it. You know why I say that? Because the only other option is stay under it. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? And if you've got Jesus Christ in your life, there's nothing he can't get you over. Or he's not the Savior and the God I've been telling you about. Amen? You know why we stay under it? Because we stay focused on what they did to us instead of what he did for us. That's why. Colossians 3.15, last scripture. And let the peace of God that comes from Christ Rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, listen to this now, not right before I let you go, listen to this. For members of one body, you are called to live in peace. You, live, you hear that? Pastor Bob, what am I called to do? I just read it to you. You're called to live in peace. So if you're not living in peace, you're living outside your calling. You, you and I, we're, we're called to live in peace. Pursue peace with all people, the Bible says. But the, one, the thing I wanted to share with you right there is it says, hey, you that are saved, let. Everybody say let. Let, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's the two words that makes that, the whole difference of that scripture. See, sometimes we think, where's God at? Why don't I have any peace? According to that scripture, it's up to you and I. It tells us to let or allow, give permission to the admission of God's peace. 
So if you and I, if we're not living in peace, it's not because of God. It's because of, we're just refusing to let it. Let, allow, give permission to the admission of God's peace, and it will rule your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. I want you to know, I believe all my heart because I read it in the scripture, but also because I've experienced it in my own life. Jesus Christ, listen, he is the gift that keeps on giving. He absolutely is. He wants to be your wonderful counselor. He's asking some of you, wherever you're at, wilt thou be made whole? He is our mighty God. He's not just a good man. He is the God man who sits at the right hand of God. He is our everlasting father. He will never leave us nor forsake us, and he's full of mercy and grace. And he is our prince of peace. If you want his peace, just make him your prince. Stand up with me, please. Stand up with me.